Hi, everyone. My name's Anthony Kaufman. I am a senior programmer at the Chicago International Film Festival and Industry Days. Um, we're really excited uh, about our Industry Pro Days program this year. Um, we are um, doing lots of stuff, as some of you know, uh, both uh, before the festival and, of course, during the festival. Um, we're really excited, of course, about the um, uh, Catherine Bostic event happening right now. And I want to urge you all to uh, sign up for Industry Days because in two weeks we're going to have a master class with Ted Hope, the uh, Maverick producer and former co-head of Amazon Studios. That is for registered Industry Days pass holders only. So uh, please go to Industry Days at the Chicago International Film Festival and sign up. So this is our second Industry Days uh, event of 2020 uh, before the festival itself. We're so grateful to be partnering with the Chicago Film Office on these events, examining the craft of sound in music and cinema. I'd like to thank Tavari Crouch and Kwame Amuku from the Chicago Film Office for their help and support with this series. Last year at the Festival and Industry Days, we presented a series of master classes around production design. And this year we're excited to be focusing on music and sound. We'll have some other master classes with composers and conversations with music supervisors. So stay tuned for more information about uh, those events and industry days in the coming weeks. I'd like to thank the city of Chicago's Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events. And now I'd like to welcome the Chicago Film Office's Tavari Crouch to say a few words. Tavari. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so as Anthony introduced me, I am um, Tavri Crouch, the independent film coordinator for the Chicago Film Office. Uh, we're a division of the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events, um, which leads the city's effort to attract and enhance the production of feature films, television series, commercials, documentaries, and all forms of local screen entertainment. Uh, so for filmmakers, uh, we're direct support for their productions, but we're also um, a support, a supporter of professional development, making sure that their craft and their development as artists is being supported. Um, so the Chicago Film Office uh, serves also as an advocate for the local film and media industry. Uh, this includes the local community of filmmakers, advocacy organizations, festivals, film festivals, distributors, and independent film and media venues. Additionally, the Chicago Film Office creates professional development tools, uh, like today's uh, masterclass with Catherine Bostic, um, and opportunities for convening and networking. Um, so we're really proud, as usual, to be partnering with Industry Days, the Chicago International Film Festival. Um, and with that, I'm going to uh, hand it over to Mimi Plache, the Artistic Director of the Chicago International Film Festival. Thank you so much, Tavari. It's my pleasure to be here. Good afternoon. Really, um, I'd like to welcome you all today and to thank you for joining us for this masterclass with award-winning composer, Catherine Bostick. In our conversations in preparation for today, I have to say that I've already been inspired by her insights and her approach to her work, and I'm so excited to hear more. So let's get started. It's my honor to introduce our guest of honor to you all today. Catherine Bostick is an award-winning composer and artist known for her work on critically acclaimed films, television, theater, and concert performances. Her films include Clemency, which we were proud to showcase at the festival last year, Toni Morrison, The Pieces I Am, and Dear White People. She is a recipient of numerous fellowships and awards. These include the Sundance Institute Time Warner Fellowship, Sundance Fellowships for Feature Film Scoring, Best Music, in film by the African American Film Critics Association, the Sundance Skywalker Documentary Film Scoring, as well as the Society of Composers and Lyricists Best Music and in Independent Film. Her end title song for the Toni Morrison film was 2020 Oscar shortlisted, and the score for this film is Emmy nominated, which just happened recently, very exciting. In 2016, she became the first female African-American score composer to join the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. She is currently in the studio recording, working on a recording of her original songs to be released later this year. Thank you for being here, Catherine, and welcome. Thank you, thank you for having me. 
I would also like to introduce our moderator um, for today's masterclass. Uh, please welcome Kubile Uner. He makes adventurous, eclectic, colorful music for media ranging from film and television to concerts and records. He blends acoustic, synthetic, and found sounds, builds his own instruments, very impressive, bends tempos, layers, noise, mixes metaphors, and is generally convinced that good music only happens when you mix things up. Credits include numerous narrative features and documentaries, including the Mel Gibson action film, Force of Nature, the upcoming Al Pacino starring feature drama, Axis Sally, and Big Sur based on Jack Kerouac's novel. We're proud to say that Kubi's current home base is Chicago, where he also serves as the director of the music composition for the Screen MFA at Columbia College Chicago. I'm so excited to welcome you both and to hear today's conversation. Um, so I'm gonna hand it right over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mimi, for this wonderful introduction. And thank you, of course, to Catherine for being here and sharing your artistry and your insights and your brilliant presence with us all. Um, I really also want to personally thank you, uh, thank the Chicago Film uh, International Film Festival and the Chicago Film Office for all the amazing work that you guys do for the uh, film community, filmmaking community in uh, Chicago, which, um, as you know, is, uh, is much richer than most people think of it being. And uh, it's no small thanks to you that this is becoming more and more known and more and more visible. So um, what I wanted to do today is um, first start off with talking to Catherine a little bit about her, how she got to where she is today as an artist, as a musician, as a human being, sort of the bio, the through line. Then we're going to do a very quick overview over the filmmaking process, just for those in the audience who may not be 100% familiar of how music gets inserted into that. And then we're going to spend the bulk of the time talking about your work using the two examples that um, were previously advertised to the people um, attending Clemency, the feature, narrative feature, and Toni Morrison, the pieces I am, the narrative, uh, the feature documentary. Um, very different films. Um, so it's a really good sort of two poles to kind of circle how you do what you do. But before we do any of this, I want to ask you, Catherine, how are you doing? These are really, really <laughs> odd times. Um, yeah. Talk a little bit about how you feel in right now in this world and how do you make your, how do you make your presence? How do I make my presence? <laughs> Well, thank goodness I'm, I'm still breathing, and I mean that for real. But before I even go there, I want to thank the Chicago International Film Festival for hosting this incredible event, because it's so important now more than ever to have a sense of community and to have a sense of a fellowship where we can all find each other and come together with a common interest and inquiry and just, you know, knowing that we're not isolated, even though we are in a time of tremendous change and physical distancing. I think it's really fa fabulous that you all have this series and that you provide this free of charge for the community. Because uh, to answer your question, that's how I'm feeling right now. I'm feeling uh, a very, um, like I'm on the, I'm, I, we're in such an epic time of change. So I feel like I'm in this, the edge of like this sweeping monsoon of change and I'm on this, the zenith of this tidal wave of change. And, and it's exciting. I mean, it's obviously very traumatic for obvious reasons. You know, we're dealing with issues of mortality. We're dealing with issues and dynamics of, of just day, moment to moment. We're having to really deal with the moment to moment uh, experience of our lives. And I think in many ways for me, while that's been challenging, it's also been refreshing because we're, you know, we're, we're conditioned to be so linear about everything. Yesterday I did this, today I have to do this, and then tomorrow, da, 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 da. And we still have that. We still have schedules. We still have our goals and desires. But because everything is so just stripped down, I mean, the, the, the starkness of this change has enabled me to be a lot more present than I actually thought I was. I, I always thought of myself as being someone who was able to have a, tr a large 
and 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 expansive sense of fluidity because I think being creative is such a gift that way in that as artistic and self-expressive people you know a lot of artists uh, myself obviously I can speak for because why not <laughs> um, you know we, we get in a zone we get in a zone that is very otherworldly and multi-dimensional so uh, my sense of time and um, uh, my sense of of just even the day-to-day -day experiences is often very different than, than a conventional and traditional sense. But so I've been, I've been really, um, you know, for the most part, I've been in a good space. I've been in a very good uh, frame of mind about everything. I really am uh, excited about the, the galvanization of, of humanity. I see the activism with the protesters uh, for Black Lives Matter. And, and, and other needed uh, conversations and action that will, that deal with imbalance and injustice being finally, you know, really, really looked at and dealt with. I mean, this is an incredible time for humanity. And that mm -hmm. part is very, very heartening for me. Great. Um, before we um, continue, I want to remind the audience, there is a and a box that you can uh, put your questions in at any moment in time, and then they're gonna get fielded to us via our friends at the Chicago International Film Festival Industry Days. So make ample use of those. We uh, want to make this into a conversation. Um, talking about the massive amounts of change, let's go back to your massive amounts of change over the years, personally. Um, uh, just let's start at the beginning. How did you get into music? Uh, what did the music sound like when you were, uh, what kind of music did you, did you encounter when you started? How did you find your way into becoming a musician? That's so funny, because when you said start at the beginning, I literally, that's <laughs> literally my path. My mother was, was an incredible pianist. She was a, a classical pianist and composer. She played a lot of her own material, obviously. She's played jazz and she had studied music at Eastman School of Music. And wow. uh, yeah, she was, she was very heavy. I, I really, you know, looking back on that opportunity I had being in that household was, it was extraordinary because she would sit at that piano for hours. That piano was her sanctuary. And in fact, she was teaching piano when she went into labor with me. So I think that when you said start from the beginning, I can actually say, yeah, that's, that's, I came out, I came out digitizing. <laughs> I, came out, I came out ready to play, you know, and that's- Did your mom remember what the piece was? That, that she playing? was teaching? Yeah. No, 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 because <laughs> Kubi, only Kubi would ask that kind of question. I love it. I want to know what brought you that's forth. Such a, what brought me forth? Well, <laughs> that's such a Kubi question. You know, you're, you're extraordinary. You know, I, I don't know. I have to say, I don't know, but I know that coming in the music in that household, you know, it's just part of my DNA. And I started at a very, very young age because I always, I would listen to her play and she had this incredible sensitivity in her playing and it, it informed me um, about so many things and also about overall sensitivity. So, so her playing for me was, it was like a, it was like a hug. It was like an embrace, it was like my sanctuary also. And then I began to create my own songs at the piano. And um, because for me, it was storytelling. Because when I heard her play, it would evoke certain feelings. And right away, I began to at least maybe not intellectually understand, but I began to appreciate that music can move people. So I just, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I was like a sponge. And in our household, we listened to everything, classical, jazz. My brother would come home with Brazilian music and then you know, he'd bring home some funk music and then I'd listen to pop and, and R&B and rock and roll. I just, you know, for me, music is such a, it's such a visceral um, uh, force. It's a right. real force. And when you, when you immerse yourself in it, 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 it really is also such a teacher. And right. it, it has really been that way throughout my life. So from there, you're playing at home, you're, you're in a music <laughs> like, family, so yeah. yeah. I, feel, I feel like I'm in a this is your life 
Um, yeah, yes, so, you so, are actually. <laughs> well, all the the women on my mother's side were all very musical, and they played and they sang, and 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 my father also had a great love for music. And then, um, you know, I was always around creative people. Um, you know, you had your neighborhood bands and your musicians, and so. For me, it, it, it was, it's such an intrinsic thing that I, I just began, I always knew it was who I was, but in terms of actually understanding that it was a calling, it's one thing to know that you uh, have this desire or this joy, but it's another thing to, to really yield to that joy because, you know, we are often taught to try much more traditional um, paths for making a living and for, you know, finding your way in your life, you know, do that, do that as a hobby kind of thing. So um, when I got to college, I was still not sure about majoring in music because of that kind of philosophy, even though my parents, you know, they never discouraged me, but I just, you know, at that age, I, I was still trying to figure it out. But what I soon discovered was that I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy doing things that were not music related. And, um, and that was very important information for me. So like I said, music's a teacher. It, taught, it's, it continues to teach me to find joy and to, to trust where that can take me. So, I mean, musicians are so cool, you know? They just are. I love being around musicians because it just, there's this unspoken, awareness that okay you answered that call you you answered that call so your family and i right. remember when i started to tour as a singer i would you know go to you know whether it was with established artists or with my own bands and and doing jazz festivals i'd meet with local musicians in these different countries and there was such a fellowship because we all just wanted to play and jam and and, and have a sense of community that way yeah, talk a little bit about that. I know you've basically played the world. Um, you have a whole life as a real, like a touring musician before you really started to do um, music for drama, for theater, and film music. Talk a little bit about how that affected your musical views and your worldview, like having yeah. played in Japan, having played in Europe. Yeah, I, I find that that was probably the best education is traveling because you really get to see really how small the world really is in spite of all the cultural differences and things of that nature. You know, when you're, when you're traveling and touring, uh, and especially in environments that you're not familiar with, you know, you, you really are, um, you have to be open and, and, and the kindness of strangers are the things that are the most memorable. So it's very humbling for me and it really began to shape my worldview about not just music, but about life. And uh, it demystified a lot of the boundaries and the polarities and polarizations that, you know, we've been led to believe. I'm not saying they're not real. There's absolutely, you know, uh, atrocities in, in systemic racism and in systemic uh, sexism and all, all of the any, anything that's a box that it's going to create this illusion of hierarchy needs to be completely destroyed and, and done away with because it's an illusion, it's a fallacy. And traveling taught me that because I mean, I'm you know, in these different countries and I am there for you know, a substantial amount of time at you know, some of the tours, I'd, I'd either stay a little later or on, on our off days. And so the kindness of people from all different walks of life was what enabled me to have a good time and to feel safe and secure. So my whole thing is to really understand the importance of your own moral compass, your own autonomy in the midst of being bombarded with so much, um, uh, so much messaging. Um, right. In traveling, I've learned to appreciate stepping back a little further from the wall so that I can have my own overview, so that I can have my own perception about what is my truth. And my truth is about understanding the importance of the unique individual autonomous voice that I have that I bring to the collective. Right. You know?
I know and, that's, I kind of went off on my tangent. Oh no, but this is a good tangent. And it actually brings me to sort of the art of film scoring, because a lot of what you're talking about, I think, has uh, a lot to do with that, that sort of stepping back the constant questioning and to really like trying to find the individual truth in front of you rather than sort of to figure out which narrative can I recycle and slap on this right. project or on this that's, scene. That's right. I mean, each film is such a gift because each film is its own essence. It's its own uh, story, its own intention. And so as a composer, that's one of the most incredible gifts of film scoring is that you, you know, you, you get to have this completely new interaction and a relationship, you know, um, and it's, it's an incredible opportunity to try different things creatively and to have that kind of um, interaction with people who you may not have ever worked with before. So it's very cool. Right. Um, let's talk a little bit about the transition from being a touring performer to going to score films. I know that you've done a lot of theater that kind of was part of your gateway drug. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, what was, uh, talk a little bit about how the, the performing musician Catherine Bostick turns into the film composer Ta Catherine Bostick. Well, you know, um, well, you make it sound like, you know, it's got some kind of... <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not like, well, it's not like the larva into the butterfly. <laughs> Sorry, that came out wrong. <laughs> it's fine. You're so, I just love it. This is definitely, for those of you who do not know Kubi, this is, this is like pure unadulterated Kubi-ism. <laughs> Kubi. Um, you know, for me, it's all... Performer, so wait, so you want to know, reframe that question. Yeah, Please. Uh, coming from a per performance background, um, how did you get into the world of theater and then film music? Well, I always, as I said, music for me was all, it's always about storytelling. Right. So in, in many ways, there's, there's a seamlessness in my, my desire to self-express musically as a storyteller is so strong that I'm always finding different platforms. I'm, I'm always having that kind of inquiries and because I'm curious and I love the collaborative process with other self-expressive people, with other storytellers of different platforms. So with theater, um, I began in college to, to collaborate just a little bit with some of the directors and, and choreographers I would talk to and they would be working on a scene or a play and I would create the music for that. And then um, the film, the film scoring kind of came about very organic. I had been asked to work uh, on a film. I was talking to a friend of mine and I was saying how I wanted to do more than just theater. I wanted to start to work in film. And uh, the next week I got a call uh, to, to work and get started on, on a project. And I just jumped right in. So there's a fearlessness I think I have. Part of it is, could just be sort of a naivete, but it's all the underpinning of everything that I do is because I'm a storyteller, whether it's performing, whether it's writing songs, whether it's working with other storytellers, that's, that's the, the core of, of my, uh, of how I self envision, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, sort of a sonic griot, you know? Uh, and I like to be able to have different platforms to express that. Right. Um, do you see a big difference between writing for theater and, or, and film? Um, or do you, is that, since it all comes from your vocation as a storyteller, is it just different ways of doing a similar thing? I see that they're similar. I mean, with theater, uh, I, I, I really enjoy that process because I'm always invested in the rehearsal process. I typically, um, when I worked, um, I w had the good fortune of working with August Wilson and uh, on Jim of the Ocean and then some of his subsequent plays um, that were produced at the Mark Taper in LA <clears throat> and other regional theaters. And, and it was important that, that I be there in the rehearsal process so that I could sense the cadence of the actors. Granted, the music is not the same because it's, you know, it's live theater. You're not going to have, you have underscore maybe to heighten some of the 
moments of tension and, and it's primarily scene transition. But I found being in the room, it, it, it really helped to inform me of the kind of cadence and the kind of tone I wanted to write. So that was really cool. And that's a difference where it's in film, you know, you're typically not on location, you're not on the set, you, you're dealing with a post-production aspect where you get a rough cut. Sometimes I'll get the script and I'll be asked to write themes to that script and the director will then do the editing and the, you know, they'll cut the film to some of those scenes, but it, it's different in that regard. Right. Um, that's a perfect transition. Let's just, I'm gonna fly over in less than 60 seconds, the entire film production process for the people in the room who are not familiar with it. And then I'll let you insert how the music gets in there just in general. And then we'll talk about Toni Morrison and clemency and the, your process on those. So film production generally starts with a script. I'm talking narrative now, Di documentary is a little bit varied um, and it changes a little bit more from film to film. But generally you start with a script, then you um, shoot the film and then you have post-production where the film gets edited together, the sound that wasn't captured on set gets added, um, this, and, uh, and that's where then the music comes in. And then in the end, the whole thing gets mixed on the audio side, all the sound that was captured on set, the sounds that were added later, the car screeches and explosions, and then um, the whole thing gets released. So talk a little bit about where the music normally comes in. You already mentioned sometimes you get a script ahead of time mm -hmm. uh, before they even shoot. Sometimes you don't. Talk about sort of the range of experiences that composers have in terms of how the music gets added and the collaboration in generalities. Well, to your, to your point, it really depends on the film and it depends on the way in which the director wants to have that process unfold and also depends on the schedule you know sometimes you have the luxury of a lot of time where you can really as i like to say marinate the vibe where you can take <laughs> your music and for instance with clemency we had we had a good amount of time which was a good thing because that film i think it was and, and the director and i've talked about this the, the remarkable award-winning chenonye chukwu we talked about the difficulty in scoring the film because this was a film that had been edited without any music and there was really no point of reference. So we really needed to have the time to find the tone, not only of the music, but once that was determined, where, where, where's the placement? So that was an instance where time was on our side. Um, I've had situations where I didn't have a lot of time. And so what I typically do is I ask to have as much specific information as possible as I can from the director and producers and uh, what their playlist is, what, what their intention is for the music. I, I don't ever expect the, the directors and, and uh, whoever is in charge, so to speak, to talk to me about music in musical terms. Once I know the characterization that they want the music to have, that's very helpful and typically when there's a less amount of time, I like to create themes that can then be used as uh, variations. Uh, I can var do variations on those themes. And sometimes I'll create like a menu, a menu of, uh, or a toolkit uh, of different types of, of uh, approaches to those themes that we can then at least have that as a basis. Right. So you have them kind of pre-made, you can throw them up against the film, talk to the director about, is this doing what we needed to do? That That's right. That's right. And, and so, and it's helpful because often, you know, they're not going to know what works until they hear it, which makes perfect sense. Right. And you're, you already brought up clemency. So I want to actually now really talk about clemency. Um, two things about, first of all, it's a very hard to watch movie, not because it's a bad movie by any means. It's a great movie, but it is so hard hitting. It is a gut puncher. Um, and, and, um, and I'm absolutely not surprised. I have no idea that it was edited without music, but now that you said it, it makes perfect sense because there is a flow to the film 
And just for the audience, um, one process that's very common is to use temporary score, temp score. And filmmakers use that for all kinds of reasons. Editors, film editors use that for all kinds of reasons. But it basically means taking music that they feel at the time may be close to what they kind of want and have that in the film during the editing process and during the whole post-production process. But it comes with certain dangers. And the one thing that I always find is one of the dangers of working with temp score is that editors and directors accidentally follow a rhythm that comes from this music that won't even be in there rather than the rhythm that the picture and the performances it themselves want and um, clemency flows incredibly well and um, i think now it makes all sense to me um, how do you, um, I always love scoring picture that hasn't been temped. Uh, how did you feel about that just as an experience compared to working with temped films? Well, I think I, I appreciate both approaches. I appreciate having a temp score that is close to the tone that might ultimately be realized because it's helpful. It's, you know, it's giving me information. Right. The, the problem with having that temp in place is when the the director uh, and the team have been living with it for so long that they want you to replicate that uh, or there's there's very little wiggle room for something that's going to be innovative and unique from that so that that part can be a little challenging but I find it to be at times quite helpful um, right. and then in terms of not having any temp you know, that's helpful too, but it's just almost the same, it's the same issue in that in Clemency, the silence was the score, you know, silence was the film score. So how do you create music that is not going, that's going to serve the same purpose, that's not going to interfere with the starkness and the, the visceral quality of that, that prison environment and of the Alfre Woodard character, the warden, yeah. her her inner her inner restraint that she'd been bottling up for so long. So, for those who haven't seen the film, it follows Alfre Woodard's character, the warden of this prison that has a death row, um, through these very formalized, ritualized processes of executions, and shows how it affects her personally. Um, it actually reminded—I don't know if you've ever seen the movie uh, Kieslowski's uh, short film about killing. But it had that same, that those mechanics, the opening of the film just. Yeah, it's intense. It's so yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, she, you know, I think, and that's what I really enjoyed about the film. She, her activism was just in laying out the story yeah. and stating, stating the facts. It wasn't proselytizing, you know, and I think that that is to me so important because you really, you, you allow for room for people to really react, really find their own, their own reaction and their own thought process. So um, I find that in that regard, it also informed the music. We went through a lot of different iterations before we got that score. It took a long time. Um, the other thing that really is big, and then we should probably play a little clip so that people can get a little taste of that. But um, the other thing I found amazing, and it goes hand in hand with what you were saying about the film being silent at first without music, is the sound design is absolutely phenomenal. Um, yeah. You know, when do you hear what? And it's always really from Alfred Woodard's perspective. So it's a mind blowing piece of work. And it really blew my mind how well you fit in there. The sound design was another instrument in your score, uh, which made the whole thing so extremely effective. Um, so should we play something real so that people Yeah, can... we, we, unfortunately we only have audio clips, but hopefully this will give you an incentive even more to, to watch the full movie so you'll have a context. And for those of you who don't know, um, both movies, Toni Morrison, The Pieces I Am and Clemency are available right now on Hulu. So if you have Hulu, um, don't watch it with ads, especially not uh, Clemency. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Buy that one month ad free just for that movie. All right. Um, which one should we call up? Um, which, which, let's see. We have Open and Bernadine Holloway. Okay. Let me um, 
set up Bernadine Hallway. So we were trying different, uh, different textures for the score. And initially we were thinking about a lot of vocal, a lot of vocal textures to reflect Bernadine's inner tug of war and her, her inner voice and her inner anguish. And so we, it became a little bit too heavy handed, but what we did walk away with was that we could have threads of a voice intermittent throughout the film. And I think we only used it maybe three times or three or four times in the entire film. So this scene is where um, the music is, Bernadine has just told um, Anthony, who's on death row and is a, his date is coming up. She's just read to him, you know, what his last meal could be and what the formalities of his execution are going to be. And she's doing it with all this restraint. And then she walks away and we see her walking down a corridor. And this is the music I use to accompany that environment, but also her inner, her sort of inner uh, journey. All right, let's hear Bernadine Hallway. Just also, since Zoom has the restriction of playback in mono, anybody interested, both soundtracks are available in the usual places, so, and they're absolutely sublime. So you can revisit Bernadine Hallway and everything else from Clemency that way <laughs> later. Um, so we have a question actually from Mimi Gember. Do you always compose on a piano? And with this cue, just having heard this cue, I want to pass that question on because that does not sound like you could <laughs> compose this on a piano. Um, talk a little bit about the process of um, the different ways you approach different types of music, depending on what the film wants in terms of the process of creating it. Well, you know, fundamentally for me, music is conversation. So my interaction as a composer is sitting with the film and really trying to engage in an active conversation with what I'm seeing. So um, in that particular scene, I, I begin to really appreciate the sound design and the foley that is part of the prison environment, the, the starkness and, you know, the footsteps and the prison cells, the, 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 the clink, clanking of the of the doors opening and, and shutting um, and just the, the brittle metallic kind of qualities. And so that began to give me an idea of the kind of palette and the kind of tone that I wanted. So that's not so much a piano tone that, that began to give me an idea for drones and ambient textures. And then also the passage of time and the, the, the routine in that passage. So I wanted to find tones that had a pulsing quality, not only the passage, passage of time in that environment, but also the passage of time going on within Bernadine, within her character, and how the groundswell of that intensity is, is going to evolve and erupt into something that is going to take her out of that, the normalcy of time. So I begin to create a palette of different, you know, I just sort of would, go through different ways of creating drones, whether it's detuning guitars or detuning different instruments and processing them differently. And also just uh, researching through my library, different textures and tones that I had already created. Um, so that's sort of a long-winded way of me saying that I, I don't always create on piano. It's, it's conversation, it's more instinctual. I mean, piano is helpful for me because I'm, very tactile with piano and I can sit down and when I play something, 
I don't necessarily say this is going to be a piano moment, but whatever it enables me to feel, I take the feeling and then I create the cue. I begin. So it's more, it's more about the feeling than actual, the actual playing on the piano. It's more about, okay, that, that, uh, for instance, on, uh, in that cue you just heard, um, I think I actually started with the, the vocal overlay first. And, and I know that, I think I, then I pitched it so that it would match some aspect of the Foley uh, and, and then made everything sort of pitched around that. Does that kind of answer the question? Yeah, 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 no, very much so. And there's actually a follow-up that actually um, um, piggybacks perfectly in this, which is Daniel Collins, what role does improvisation play in your compositional process uh, do you think through the entire score before you start composing or is it more an organic spontaneous process and you kind of already answered that in your conversation with the film metaphor yeah i don't i don't ever think through anything <laughs> you, know, you know not 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 you know a to z I, i'm not that kind of a writer and i'm not that kind of a person i try to I really try, I really value fluidity. Like I, as I expressed earlier um, in, in how I'm coping with these times and, and I apply it to the music. So, you know, as I said, it's conversation. I mean, yeah, you have your structure. You absolutely have very specific direction that you're given and you have to be able to have the music reflect that direction. Otherwise you're gonna lose the job. <laughs> So you can't just go off into lofty land and, you know, be so improvisational. But I find that in the improv, in, in being in, improvising, that is akin to conversation for me. And I might come up with, with an idea or a motif that serves as a thematic touchstone in what I'm doing. Do you find sometimes that you are five cues into the film and then in Q5 you go like, okay, now I actually cracked it. I need to go back and fix one, oh, two, yeah. four. Oh, absolutely. Yes, you, you really, you have to give yourself, especially if you can, if you can find that time, you have to give yourself that ability to revisit and revise and review, you know, so, cause like I said, that's the fluidity of it. And, you know, that's how you get to the sweet spot of what you're doing, you know, if you think it's just, okay, but I know this is the theme that I started with and it's gotta be that because it, you know, I mean, sometimes it does work. It does work like that for me. The Toni Morrison film, that opening, which unfortunately I, I didn't, sh I forgot to share, but when you watch the movie, that opening cue is that, that just came right away. Is this is, this is the way to start this. And it right. works. And it's a great visual too. Yeah. So um, it's an amazing scene. Um, Let's talk about Toni Morrison, uh, a very different film, a very different score. Um, and something that you said earlier stuck with me because I always find documentaries extremely hard. I think they're a very challenging form um, because the, depending on the documentary, but Toni Morrison is actually a great example. You know, when you have Bernadine walking down the hallway after she had him like choose his menu and he looks at her like, what's wrong with you? Um, that that you there it's not easy to put into a word but there is an emotional clarity but when you have a lot of the moments in the Toni Morrison documentary that needed music they're about so many things at once and somebody's talking throughout all of it and so um to me it's a much more difficult task to hit that tone and at the same time be out of the way and then earlier today you were talking about working with theater and catching the flow of the actors and that to me was like oh well there that's that's how you get good at this uh, because it is about sort of catching the flow of what is happening in the in the film at that time talk a little bit about the difference in terms of you know like tackling a scene like Bernadine walking down the hallway and, and a Toni Morrison voiceover passage when she's talking about, you know, her grandfather or something. Well, you know, for me, um, as I said, I have a very organic way of crafting my scores and everything is energy. Everything in life is energy. It emanates some kind of energy. And 
Toni Morrison, you know, and, and, and the people who, the guest speakers who are featured in her film, they have such a combustion, they have such a vibrance. So it wasn't really challenging to score, so to speak, with talking heads. It was so much more dimensionalized than, than that. This is a film where, first of all, her, her presence and her voice and the cadence of her voice is so commanding. It has such a, it's just huge. And so what I t tapped into was the energy of, of who she is and the people speaking on her behalf, speaking about her, um, were, were very also, they had their own energy. So I really, with this film, it just had so much depth in regard to energy, you know? Um, for instance, this, let's do the scene, I think it's called Books. Hang on. Yeah, book a, covers. Book covers. So this particular scene occurs when there's a, there's a montage of all her books, not all of them. The last one, I don't think we were able to get in the film, but the various book titles and the way in which they are just front and center in our psyche. So we're seeing all these book titles of Toni Morrison's work. And that right there, just the cadence, cadence of it was so powerful. So I wrote this, a very brief clip, but I wrote this music to go over the visual of seeing her book titles. So let's talk a little bit about how, because it's interesting when you were talking about latching on to the cadence of Toni Morrison's voice or the other speakers, um, it reminded me a lot about accompanying a singer. Mm -hmm. Like uh, when, not written accompaniment, but like when you have to free form comp. Um, mm -hmm. Is that a valid comparison? Yeah, that's a valid comparison because I'm having to sculpt and craft the music around the, the talking. And, and also how does that serve what's being said? And, and what's, the, what's the emotional intention behind that? Um, so in some ways it is similar. Right, how do you, especially with films like that, that are not um, in, 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 in sections, uh, well, how do you avoid becoming almost like, cause this, I love this score and it's the opposite of easy listening, but there are plenty of documentaries where the score ends up approaching easy listening. <laughs> um, how do you avoid that? How do you, how do you keep that authenticity or the grit? Well, or, I mean, what is even me, the difference? <laughs> I mean, I, in this film, in this working on this film, I was very fortunate because the creative team the director, Timothy Greenfield Saunders, and um, the editor, Johanna Giebelhaus, were very much about wanting something authentic. They, and, and they really trusted that process and they trusted how it was going to unfold um, in terms of the power of that. They, they, you know, you can always do some easy music that add water and stir, but this is Toni Morrison, you right. know, it, you have to honor with reverence who she is. So I'm going to come up with something that reflects that. And, and so we all worked from that vantage point. We all worked with the same amount of respect and understanding that we, we had a very huge responsibility to deliver something that is authentic and purposeful and powerful because that's, you know, this, the, the, that this film demands that. I don't, you know, I think the way I write and the way I create, I'm, I'm always 
about innovation on some level, even if it's, even if I'm asked to do things that are formulaic to a whatever extent in terms of genre, I always try to, I have to put myself in it. I can't, I can't just be this add water and stir kind of composer. You know, I'm, I'm always going to show up with who I am and that's going to be a part of the film score. That's going to be a big part of it. So it's just the way I'm wired. You know, I don't really do well with generic kind of sounds or right. sound likes. Well, and especially with this subject matter, I think you really have, a, you, you feel like the pressure, you got to live up to that. Um, yeah, well, it's also- Encouragement, I should say. It's not so much pressure then. Yeah, it's not pressure because she's such a force. I mean, you just, like you're saying, you know, I had a, I heard this beautiful term the other day, vibrational integrity. What is the vibrational integrity uh, that, that we all have? And her vibrational integrity is so massive and impactful that you, you rise to that occasion. I mean, it, I felt very fortunate to work on this film. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, every, I, I just watched it again for the second time. I watched it when it first came out. And every time I see it, um, I want to get up and write. <laughs> I feel yeah. like I got to yeah. go do something. That's um, right. I'm going to ask you one last question, and then we're going to go to questions from the audience. Perfect. We've got some good ones here. Okay. But um, can you talk a little bit about the specifics in Toni Morrison on, on the process. We already heard that in Clemency, it was pretty much a blank slate and you guys went through a lot of iterations to find the proper approach. How did that go in Toni Morrison? Was there a temp? Were the, give us a little bit sort of the technicalities. Well, in this film, um, they asked me for my library. They wanted, to, they wanted to hear the music that I had available that I had already written so they could create, they could, have scenes and lay in the music that way to see if the tone worked. So we started off with that and I got a lot of scenes just so I could begin to, as my term, marinate the vibe, uh, I could begin to, to merge with that kind of feeling and uh, intention. And then once the scenes were more defined and once there was a rough assembly, um, I began to create the thematic ideas. I was also told that the upright bass was something they really liked in terms of the tone of that. And that's when I began to say, okay, I can have that as a solo instrument as well as in a jazz quartet. So that's kind of what gave, gave that, kind of, um, that kind of choice was because they had been temping it with some, some uh, upright bass as well. But this again was, uh, I had quite a bit of time on this film and, um, and there was such a beautiful give and take um, in the process. I mean, it, it, this is one of the few films I've ever scored where I think I got three notes total oh, in terms yeah. of revising. I know, I know, that never happens. <laughs> Um, Ikechi asks, what visual elements from the film, color, lighting, etc., do you look for when composing a score, if any? Well, all. <laughs> I mean, you know, all of them, again, it's conversation. So you're, all of those aspects of filmmaking are a part of that conversation. And they're going to inform me of tone, of a certain emotional, for instance, um, in clemency, if the lighting is a certain way and the shot is a certain way, that's going to give me information how to score. So it, it, it's, I look at the music as another character, as another part of that conversation. And sometimes the music has moments of a lot of silence in between notes, because to me, silence is also a big part of score. Right. Um, one thing I want to touch on is um, working as a creative artist, especially a creative artist in the world of film, documentary, etc., um, in the era of COVID. 
Um, there is a lot of sort of despair and um, I don't mean this in a disparaging way, but like deer in the headlight moments where we're just paralyzed. Um, how, how can people get, get, the, get, uh, get back in the flow? Because we don't know how much longer this is going to be with us. And um, so how can we keep creating now that the world has changed in these weird, violent ways? Yeah, that's a really, I, I think the most important thing is to try to stay present. I know people talk like this, you know, a lot in terms of philosophical uh, expose, but it is a very helpful, like for me, I try not to get too far ahead of where we are. I try not to, to get too far ahead of the day actually, you know, because it, it, it's so overwhelming. Every time you turn on the news or read something, you know, you're hearing about COVID and, and also just the immediacy of with friend, friends and family. So I, I try to stay in a place of uh, appreciating the fact that I love storytelling. So for me, I, I just, I've been writing a lot of my songs and finishing my record. And then some days, you know, if I don't feel like doing anything, I don't do anything. And I don't feel, I don't punish myself for that. I, I try to really pay attention to the fact that I can still make a choice in my, in my outlook. And, and some days it's easier than others. And that's part of being human. Um, I think to find things that you appreciate that are happening in your life, it, the, even the smallest of things, just, you know, being able to breathe. And then especially now being able to, to have whatever you have that is something that brings you relief and joy. And it's very, very challenging. It's not an easy time because there is so much that's uncertain. And in the uncertainty, is a, oftentimes a lot of fear. But I think that the good news is that creative people, we, we work with uncertainty all the time. We, just by creating, you don't know, you're starting with a blank canvas every time you sit down to create music or to create a scene or, or start your writing process. And, and there's something very um, pure about that uncertainty. And so in that, in that place and in that kind of a mindset, I'm able to give myself more room to kind of, you know, to exhale and not, not be so, oh my God, what this, and I've got to this and I've got to that. And also find your community of friends and family that you feel really, really are going to nurture you and be there for you. And if you, you if, even if it's just one person or maybe it's just taking a walk or, or looking at something that inspires you. For me, I've, I've been looking at birds. I go out and I watch these birds interact and fly around and it's fascinating to me. So I don't wanna come off like the bird lady, but nature <laughs> in general has been a big part of my sustenance. I, I, you know, it's funny. I hear that from a lot of composers. I have that myself. I think it's the antidote to the writing desk, dark room, yeah. computer. <laughs> um, we have a little bit more time and we have one more question that I think is very um, interesting to close. Uh, Angela Hahn says, what embodies for you a meaningful and rewarding collaborative experience? Hmm. I'd say communication, trust, openness, respect, respectfulness, um, you know, I think one of the most beautiful things about collaborating, especially for the first time you start working on a project, is, is the is that it's new, it's the freshness of it. And in that is a lot of room for imagination and curiosity. 
and to not be afraid of that, not be afraid of the fact that you're investigating, you're, you're, you're stepping into the unknown and there is something very powerful about that. Oftentimes it's understandable when you first have to present your music to the director or to the team, you're, you're nervous. You're like, oh my God, I hope this doesn't, you know, blow, the, blow this out the water. But the thing is, is if you, in that process of creating that music for that film, if you have that energy of excitement and joy, regardless of what the feedback is, it's still gonna translate. It may not, let's say you write something and it's beautiful, but it doesn't work for that scene. You haven't lost anything, There's, you haven't failed at anything. You're just trying different ways of expressing what that scene is about. And in the meantime, you, you've had something that, ex, that gave you excitement. And that's hopefully translates to everyone in the team. So I would just say those types of things for me are very important. Communication, being passionate about the collaboration, being uh, excited about the process and being open, being really fresh with it. That, those are great words to end on. What a great sentiment. <laughs> Thank you so much, Catherine. It's always such a delight and, uh, and an inspiration, a pr truly profound. Oh my delight. goodness, thank you. I, I, have, I hope what I said was insightful and helpful to everyone. And I just wanna, again, thank you all for being here and thank the Chicago International Film Festival and the film organization for having me. And thank you, Kubi, for bringing me uh, on their radar the way you have. My pleasure. I, it's, I think we're all the lucky ones here. So wow. thank you so much. And oh, thanks I'm everybody honored. for being here. Um, I don't know how Zoom applause works, but I'm sure you're all <laughs> applauding for Catherine right oh, now. Oh, I'm applauding back at you. <laughs> yeah, also, so am just, I. yeah, all you creatives out there for answering the call, because it is not for the faint of heart to do what we do. So I applaud you all. And it's a true, true honor to be here. I really appreciate that you took the time out of your day to, to be here and share this with us. Thank you. Thank you.